I'm Steve. Welcome to the workshop and I'm here with a project for the wonderful world of woodworking for Carpetech and I hope you enjoy it. I've been thinking, you know, a lot of people when they think about making something automatically the majority of people think, oh, what can I get at the big shop warehouse or the local hardware store? And they don't think that there is timber available that they can get relatively inexpensively if they've got the machinery to process it. So what I thought tomorrow, I'd go out in my yard that is an absolute mess and pick up a couple of bits of timber that you would, I reckon, bypass. You'd walk past it, wouldn't think twice about it. And you'd be amazed at how well it comes up and how nice it looks. And it might give you an inkling next time you're kicking around the timber yard or out the back or somewhere that you see a bit of timber, you go, oh, yeah, I might be able to make something with that. So join me tomorrow when I go out, pick a bit of timber, and we start building a little footstool out of whatever timber I bring in. So I'll see you tomorrow. It's really amazing what you find around the backyard. There's a bulb. But in particular, there's a piece of timber. I'm going to cut about 1.2 metres out of it from about here to here. This is a working workshop and it's messy and I make no apologies for that whatsoever because no one else is here or has to put up with it except me. All right, now I've done that, I'll put my apron on and become a woodworker. And you'll note when I'm cutting, the board is bowed this way so I'm actually running onto the blade like that with pressure against the fence. Then when this comes off, this board will be on this side and this will part. Whereas if I go this way and I have pressure next to the fence, when this board's finished, there's an air gap underneath and the board will then drop down on the blade, which can cause a, a snatch or a cut that you don't want somewhere. So uh, now I want 240 finished size. What I'm going to rip these at are 250, so I've got room to dress it up. And you'll notice there's a kerfing knife in there because boards like this can jam, which means as I cut, the stress in the timber actually pulls those two boards together in some cases. So when I'm over here, there's no gap between the two boards, there's no area for the curve of the blade to go and you get a snatch and it can actually throw it back and it creates a dangerous situation. So there's a riving knife in there. I've got the blade just above the timber I'm cutting and I'm up against the fence and the fence is secured. I've set that, as I said, at 250. Dust extractor on, blade on, let's go. And use a push stick. From these off cuts, I want two 70 mil strips. So I'll set my fence up at 70 mil. Actually, I'll set it at 75. That gives me room to clean up. Same thing, up against the fence. Push stick, turn on the saw. And 
and the other one. I want to get out of that knot if I can. Okay, there's all the components that were cut up, all oversized, but they do need to be dressed. Now, in this particular case, these two planks here or boards they're okay I can do those on the jointer and put them through the thicknesser but these ones are a little bit out so I don't know what I'm going to do just see if I can put that through the thicknesser actually and if I can it's going to save me a lot of drama all right I, I tried I tried to take a shortcut, didn't work. I thought, oh, I'll put it through the thickness here and just skim a little bit off the top. But as I really thought would happen, as you can tell, if I turn it side on, it still has a bow in it. So what I've got to do is just take this crown off here and then when I've got it flat, I can put it through the thickness. So that's one of the great misnomers that people assume, especially that, well, not even those just starting out in the woodwork. I've seen experienced people that should know better do the same. You think, oh, I'll just put it through the thickness and it'll make it parallel. No, all the thickness it does is mimic what's on the underside. So if you've got a twisted board, you put it into the thicknesser, it will come out thinner, but it'll still have the twist in it. That's why you need a jointer, but unfortunately I've only got a 200 mil jointer, an eight inch jointer. And uh, I've never found the need to spend the extra to get a 16-inch uh, jointer. And that's what I'd go for if I went for another jointer. I'd go from a, an 8-inch to a 16-inch. Anyway, it's not the end of the world. We can do it. So the crown part, we'll put in the vise. Grain direction is running that way. Put a dog in. The H&T Gordon tail vise. And we will just only take us a jiffy to fix this. And we'll be back in business. What I'm looking for is a plane that's going to go from this side to that side and not ride over the hump. I want a flat on either side. Nice little candle wax on it. And away we go. Now if I hold the plane there, I can see I've still got a bit of light coming through here and a bit through here, so a bit more to go. But I'll work my way up the board. And back again. Nearly got it. Yep, happy with that. So what I'm going to do now, take this board into the machine shop, put it through the thickness, huh? Then we should end up with a nice square board. I'll just check these. 
we might just knock these off as well. These are pretty close. Okay, that'll do too. All right, back in a tick. What I like to do whenever I can, and even though I said this is gonna be mainly machines, I like to keep in touch with uh, hand plane work and keep on sharpening your skills. So with this, we might as well just quickly run a smoothing plane over it. I'm not gonna use this plane here because it's got a square mouth or a square blade and that's going to leave tram tracks whereas if I use a number three this has got the corners of the blade just rounded over so in theory it shouldn't leave tram tracks or marks put it in and we'll we'll have a look we'll see if it works Put some candle wax on the bottom. I'll just decide which side I'm going to have. That side or this side. I think this can be the downside. We'll have this as the upside. It actually has a little bit of fiddle back on it, which is quite nice, which is very evident. Once you put the plane over, I'm sure if you can see it there, but it's just got a nice bit of fiddle back going through it. That will do. I want to pick a, a face side and a face edge. So this one's nice and straight. And we'll put that face mark there. So we've got a face mark here and also I've just shot this on the jointer so I know that that's straight too so it's square. So when we do any cutting or any measuring we take it off of this side. So I'll go over and dock this to size. That's now docked to size. Just take some dags that happened off the saw just do the same on these two bits then our doctor size not the right width but the right length so now I'm going to mark in on the underneath I'm going to come in 50 mil And actually what I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna use a dado blade. So I only need one measurement because then once the saw is set up, I do both sides that are gonna be exactly the same. All right, and put a dado blade in. Now I've set up the dado blade and as you can see, it's a set of 
several blades put together. So it didn't need a different insert in the saw and really the rip fence is not worthwhile because we're taking such a wide gap out it won't come together and I've got some spare blades that I don't need. This is set at about 17.2 oh, mil and I've got the depth set at 7 mil. I've also lined up the outside of the cut that I want to the outside of the blade. When you're using dado blades, don't rely on the fence measurements because they're going to be out. Because normally, that's where your blade sits and the fence measurement is from this point to the fence. But now we've broadened it by another 14 mil, obviously the fence is going to be out. So we'll just see how this goes. So I'll be using the fence as a guide and also a table sliding miter box to guide it. I'm not going to put a fence down on this end because I've got the fence here and it's dangerous to have two fences. All right, let's go. Dusty on. Saw on. Push it through. And there we have a lovely dado. Turn it around. Move it up to the fence. Done. Turn the saw off. Dust the off. See how close we are. All right, I'll check these and they're just a little bit too tight. So what I'm going to use is some side rebate planes. So these are H&T Gordons, they come in a pair set. Or another one, I'm not sure they're still available, but it's a Stanley 79. It does the same thing. You can plane and enlarge a rebate by using this little chap here. So you can go this way, turn it around, and this way. Comes with a depth setting foot on it. And they're pretty good, but I've got to admit, I like H&T Gordon, so I'll use H&T Gordon stuff. These also, just, just as a side issue, these come with a fitting on the side and a dovetail fence. So when we get around to doing sliding dovetails, so these are the planes I'll be using, but, but that's a fair time down the track. So I'm just gonna broaden these out a little bit I'm going to try not to come to this end because I don't want to get any blow out. See how we're going. Pretty darn close. And like the other planes, I like having a bit of candle wax. It does help them cut a lot better. We're almost there. So that will do for that one. This end, it's yep, still a little bit too big. So for that one, I'm using the other one in the set, and I think this would be the left-handed one, the other one would be the right-handed one. That's pretty good there. So what I'll do, also at this stage, I think we'll look for a top and a bottom. Okay, so it's going to be top outside. So that's the top outside. And this is going to be the top inside. Um, this is going to be left hand side and we'll mark here left hand and this is a right hand and we'll look at the top and the bottom here i think we'll have that on the inside 
and that is the top. So it's going to be top, inside, right hand, and the top here. <coughs> I might just give that a little bit of a tap. Trouble with these big boards, because I didn't allow it to season, normally what you would do if you were machining this to size, and you saw at the beginning of the video, it was outside, I would rough cut this and then skim it and then just let it sit for two or three days to acclimatise. But what I've done, I've brought it in from the really hot sun, it's about, oh, I don't know, 32, 34 degrees out there. Brought it in here to an air conditioned workshop that's running at 20 degrees at the moment. But the real temperature, I'll tell you what the real air temperature is. 23 degrees, so there you go. Um, and the, the heat's changed, the moisture content's changed, so it will cup on you a bit. But and there we have it. And it's gone home nicely. Uh, and I might look down there. That's home on both sides. Which is what I want. Have you figured out what we've done yet? It's a stool or a table. It doesn't really matter, but what I want to do is just dress up these ends and put these rails on there for rigidity as well as design feature, I suppose. So we'll just measure those out and see how much we need. Mark them off with a pencil. and then we'll go and dock those to size. Now we can nail them on, we could glue them on, or then we're in the mood for using the dado, I think I'm gonna put some dados on there. So work out where they need to be positioned here. And to do that, we've got to get everything home and square. So bring that in. Square, that square, this should be the length of that, and it is. We've already got the dado saw set up at this width, so let's go and run these through the data, and we'll do the same depth. So everything's going to be exactly the same, we'll just cut a couple of dados. Now before you do this, of course, make sure that this is square and parallel because we have to go from one side here and then turn it over. And so if this edge is nice and straight and it's against the fence, you're going to get a nice 90 degree dado. But when we do the other side, we have to turn around this side and if it's not parallel, this dado won't be square to the known edge. So just make sure it's dressed all the way around. Put it up to the fence. Saw on, dust extractor on. One dado. Now because before we were a little bit tight, we should be tied here too, which we are. What I've done is knock the fence just a smidgen 
if you know how big a smidgen it is, not very much, away from the blade. So I'm going to take just a hair's breadth off the inside and that should give us the right fit. You can't even hear it being sawn off. But I think, there you go, that's what we need, just so it'll fit in. And I'll do the same to the other side on the other one as well. What that does, of course, it just saves us a bit of time. Goes there. Now we could put this here as a brace if we wanted to, but I just really want to have it up the top here. So now we're going to have to take some off the inside top. So when we put it all together, it's going to clip onto the legs here on the side and also into the top. So all I'm going to do now is just mark this part here, set it up so the inside of the blade is just level with that pencil mark. The grip is the thing to have in this situation. Dusty on. And here we go. There you have it. To the other one. Turn the saw off. Now that locks in there and sits nicely. I don't like this sharp corner. So what I want to do is measure down just below the thickness here. I'll just mark a line down there and we'll take that sharp corner off. And for that I'll just come over to the docking saw and I'm just going to cut that angle. So now, all things being equal, which they should be, that fits on there, that fits on there, and that pulls up nicely there. There we have the makings of a stool. And we'll do the same to the other side. Now, one thing that makes this tool a bit rickety is the fact that it has these straight edges along here. That's a lot of contact on the floor. So if you've got a slate floor or a concrete floor and it's a little bit uneven, this is going to rock. So we have to reduce the contact area. In other words, take something out so it's going to be more stable. So what I think would look good is if I drew an arch in there, or you could do a V, and you know, we'll do an arch. Alright, so I've got something to make a circle with. We'll take these out. Make sure we got the top and the top, so that's the top, that's the top. We'll work on the inside. By the way, these are fantastic. They're called sewing revolutions. A friend of mine developed them quite a while ago and they are just absolutely brilliant for setting out 
circles or radiuses or anything like that. Now there won't be a nail hole in this because all I'm going to do is cut out one and I'll transpose it onto the other. So I'll put my pencil in the three and a half inch and just draw that half circle. Anyway, I'll go and cut that on the bandsaw. As in this case, if your saw's too wide for this curve, just do a lot of deep cuts. I should change the blade, but I'm too lazy. It's too late in the afternoon. Once you've got those cut, you'll find it's a lot easier. to cut the shape you want. And once you've got that, we can either clean it up with a spoke shave, or what I'm gonna do, because I'm in a hurry, I'm gonna use a bobbin sander. And there we have it, sanded underneath. Now all I have to do is transfer this onto that. And because I'm leaving this as handmade, if they're not perfect in their radius, it doesn't matter, it lends to the handmade persona, if you like. I'll just cut that out and I shall be back. And there they are, both nicely sanded. If I was to use a spoke shave on these, instead of sanding, you'd use a round spoke shave. Now that's, these are H&T Gordon spoke shaves. That is a rounded one, it has a round face, and that is a flat one. You might be more familiar with the record or Stanley ones. That is a radius one and that's a flat one. Either will work fine. Now you've got to go from short to long. So I will start in the middle here and work my weight, whoops. Put a bit of water in there to stop it from slipping like it just did. Start in the middle and work your way up. And that will plane them so you get that plane look. If it's too big, this is a little one to use. It's called a cigar spoke shave. Again, H&T Gordon. And it is absolutely superb for very, very tight radiuses. What I want to do also is arrest the edges again so it's got that hand hewn sort of feel and look to it. Turn it around to the other side. And it gets that nice, polished sort of look to it when it's come off a spoke shave. We might just clean this off with a spoke shave as well. For that we can use a, a flat one. Or, 
you didn't want to use a spoke shave, you can definitely use a block plane. As soon as it starts to squeal, it needs a bit of candle wax. Now if I go over here, I'm going to break that end out. So what I'm going to do is turn it around and I'll plane into the timber. Same with this one, we'll start with this one first if you like. Plane into the timber. Now that top part's done, turn it around and we can harass it and plane up that mitered face or angled face. Knock off the sharp angles and take the sharpness off on the inside. I'm not worried if I leave plane marks on this because I want it to, you can tell that it's handmade and hand hewn. Now's the time to clean up the legs and the top. I did want this at 240 but really it doesn't matter what width it is. Just make sure we've got clean sides on everything and they're the same width. That one's all right. That's just a bit nasty there. So I might just run a plane over that. It should only take one or two passes. It's a little bit here to get out. And that's that. Let's make sure it's square, which for me is pretty darn good. And let's make sure these are still the right length, width. Gotta take a little bit off here and we should be good to go. Let's look at this side make sure it's I'll clean that up too with a, with a pass. So while we're here, I think we'll take these sharp edges off as well. Same on the foot. Take a pass off. There's just a make sure it's nice and smooth I can't stress it enough how important it is to have sharp tools whether they're planes, chisels, saws it really doesn't matter but it just makes woodworking that much more pleasurable I think we're just about ready to put it all together now. Left hand side inside. Right hand side inside. That's it. 
So that's holding together nicely, which means the joints are good. That's sitting nicely like that. Those joints are good. And likewise with this side. So all the joints are good and that's not going to fall apart. But what we will do now, and I really don't know, for effect, I think I'm going to put brass screws in here, but it's effect only. You could nail it. You could put um, hidden screws in it. Yeah, I think brass screws. I'll go and see what brass screws I've got. Well, it's been a couple of days and I've had a look everywhere for some decent brass screws. Can't find them. They don't have them in the hardware shops anymore. It appears all the brass screws are Phillips head and the ones I've got are a little bit too big for the size of this job. So what I've decided is I'm just gonna put ordinary screws in there and then I'm gonna make buttons to go over the top of the screws. As yet, don't know, might make them out of the same timber or I might make them out of a contrasting timber. We'll work that out a little bit later on. So because that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go over to the drill and I'm gonna drill holes that are going to be big enough to take the plugs that I'll cut with the plug cutter. So let's go over to the drill. I might just go a little bit deeper. And obviously because I'm cutting into the board like this, it also acts as a countersink so I don't have to use a countersink there to get the screw heads in. They're done. Now they're done, I'm just going to work out how deep to cut the plugs. And you want them a little bit bigger than the depth so you can trim them off later on. Okay, that's four mil. They're four mil. So I'm going to cut these plugs at about five or six mil, five and a half mil. And then the screw head will go in there. The plugs can go in, then when they're dry, I can cut them off with a chisel or a plane. Let's go back to the drill, but I'm thinking, I think I'll do these in ebony so we get a bit of contrast. So I've obviously used a piece before for plugs and we'll take the force and a bit out. One good thing and one very annoying thing about this drill, it's got a preloaded chuck key, which means if you leave it in, it falls out automatically, which is good because you don't leave it in and turn the drill off, but it's bad because you can't leave it in. So you can't have it every way, I suppose. Anyway, okay. So that's the plug cutter in there. You just got to keep an eye on where they land. And there you have them. 16 plugs ready to go in. Let's make sure the hole size is right, which it is. So what we do now is drill the clearance holes. I'm going to be using a uh, 6 by 25 gauge, uh, 6 gauge by 25 mil. And the same to the rails. And 
and then just go over it with a chisel and any bits like this that are poking up as a result of the drill bits, just clean them off so you don't have any dags hanging out. You could just leave it and screw it, but if it's not going to come apart again, just wax some glue on there. Um, I'm just going to use this. This is Type Bond 2. A lot of times I would use high glue, but a lot of people don't have high glue. That's why I'm using this. So we just give that a bit of a long now. I'm not going to bother double gluing this one because it's going to be screwed down as well. Just make sure it. Make sure it's home. Now we can pop the screws in. So now we can put the side rails on. And might as well put a bit of glue on them as well, I guess. Just a little bit, not too much because the screws are going to do the main job, but it's just insurance if you like. Try not to go past where the timber is going to be sitting with the glue so then you don't get dried glue where you don't want it. Side. So we've got several locking mechanisms. You've got the joinery work with the rebates and the dados. You've got the gluing and also you've got the screwing of it, so it's going to be pretty darn stable. And there you have a really nice stable footstool or foot stand, or whatever it is you want to use it for. And it was made out of, if you can remember, just some timber that was hanging around the back of the yard. What I will do is I'll put the plugs in and then we'll give it a really good sand, leave the plugs in there to dry overnight. You've noticed I've drawn a design here that at some later stage, we'll use that as a carving project so you can actually put a design into the top of it but for now let's put the plugs in and we will just get something to put that glue in with I think I'm going to use a kebab stick or a sashlik stick or whatever they're called because I don't want to squeeze glue into it it could make a mess, whereas if we just put it on like this, just put a drip in there and a drip in there and there. Whoops, made a bit of a mess on that one. Yeah. Take that off. And we will just tap these in. I would like to have the grain going in the right direction, but unfortunately I haven't got my glasses, strong glasses on, so I'm guessing it.
Now when it comes to cutting these off, you've got several choices. We can use a, a flush saw, a French dowel saw, a sharp chisel, or just sand them off. And there you have it, all the plugs nicely in. And what we'll do tomorrow, come down, plane any bits off that need planing, we'll take these uh, tops of the plugs off, give it a coat of oil, and see how she comes up. So now these are nice and dry, just got to take those off, get it flush, give it a good sand, and then some oil, and we'll see how she comes up. Several ways you can do it, as I said before. This is a flush saw, and as you can tell, it can saw flush to your job. This is a French version of the same thing. So there's no kerf on the outside, and you can just saw off like that. And the other way you could do it would be with the chisel and give it a knock. What I've found to be the easiest way is just a block plane. The reason I wouldn't use a chisel on this is I can't quite see which way the grain's going and the ebony's pretty tough. And because it's not very deep, if I hit it with a chisel, I can run the risk of tearing out part of the plug from the top of the job. So block plane it is. Finally set and we just Laying off the top until we get down to the lid or the, the top of the stool. It doesn't take that long. As I said, this ebony is pretty tough, but we're almost there now. And there we are. We're down nice and flush. So we'll just do it to the rest of them. And we will be good to go. The other thing you could do, if you don't have a plane or a flush saw or anything like that, you could sand it off with a belt sander, but be very, very careful because if you get too close to the top, you're going to mar the timber. So for me, the best way is the block plane. Next thing is I'm just going to even it all out, then we'll sand it. But before we sand it, these pencil marks I've put on because I thought I might do some carving and the pencil lines I've got here to mark out where the drill holes went, take them off first with an eraser. Don't try and sand them off because if you try and sand pencil, what you actually do is force the graphite deeper into the grains of the timber and then you end up getting undulations there because you're trying to sand the pencil out and you're actually pushing it in deeper and deeper. This design, I still want to carve that, but for the time being, I'm going to take it off so we can oil it and then we can carve it later on if we want to or if there's sufficient interest in doing a carving project. Plane up there, make sure it's nice and flush. And I'm just going to knock an arras off the corner there, which you could do with sandpaper easy enough. But if you've got the plane in your hand, you might as well use the plane. Same on the other side. Remembering to go with the grain. 
so he don't get tear out. And uh, Blackwood is pretty notorious for tear out. On the ends too. All right, now we'll give it a sand and we'll put some oil on it and it'll be good to go. I'll start with 100 grit. <laughs> Once you've gone over it with 100 grit, all you're going through now is the grades to take away the scratches left by the sandpaper before. So this is nice and smooth now, but it's got 100 grit marks in it. So I'm going to go up to 150, 180, 240, and then we'll put some oil on it. Okay, that's it, 240. Rub your hands over it. If you find a couple of spots where the sander couldn't go in, just get a bit of 240 and just take any sharpness off that you might feel there. Okay, now that's all done. Let's put some oil on and we'll see how good it looks. What I'm using is tongue oil, uh, only because it's a lot thicker and it'll go on and I need less coats. A lot of times I would use a Danish oil and that requires a lot of coats because it's very, very thin. But we'll put some tongue oil on and we'll just watch the colors pop. And I'm pleased to say those buttons don't blend in with the timber that I'm using. You can see they're quite pronounced there. The reason I like using steel wool is it actually abrades the timber and very gently cuts into it that allows the oil to go in deeper. Normally tongue oil is, is clear when it comes out of the can, but I've had that can for quite some time and obviously some wood shavings have got into it, which has discolored it a little bit, but when it goes on, it's clear and that's what we're looking for. As you can tell, I've been pretty liberal with the oil in an hour or so. I'll take off any excess residue of the oil, let it harden overnight, then I'll put a nice polish on it. This one's Lebron Black Bison, and it's a dark color, so that'll go really well with the blackwood. And that's it. And you've got a lovely little footstool, or a stool for the workshop, or a little table if you've got kids on the ground, or yourself if you wanna sit on the ground and have a game of cards or something or other. It's a little table. But I think you'll agree that what we have now, compared to what it was a few hours ago, is something quite special and quite unique. So I guess the object was not only to share with you a project that you can make, but also make you aware that horrible gray looking bits of timber that's lying around someone's backyard has value. And with a bit of time and a bit of effort, and a little bit of experience, you can pick up 
what could be an absolute bargain. So until then, and we meet again, thank you for your interest, your watching. If you've got any questions or you'd like more projects in the future, please fill in the comments below or contact Carbotech if you like, or you can email me directly at woodworkingmasterclass at gmail.com or admin at woodworkingmasterclass.com.au. In the meantime, stay creative, stay positive and enjoy whatever it is you're doing. And I look forward to meeting again very, very soon. Bye for now.